Royal Caribbean has outdone itself with Icon of the Seas thanks to new innovations, changes, and a few tweaks. And overall, I've enjoyed sailing on the new biggest cruise ship in the world because of the things that really stand out as being important. Subtle changes, such as the pool deck being broken up so it doesn't feel like just another cruise ship pool deck to adding stairs, escalators, and shortcuts have really had an effect on the enjoyment factor. Like any Royal Caribbean ship, I can't help but compare and contrast it to other ships, and I found a number of things that I really enjoy and some other things I wish they would change. Being the first ship in the Icon class, it's impressive to me how much Royal Caribbean got right out of the gate. The line has spent a great deal of time mocking up venues at their headquarters and utilizing virtual reality to better understand the flow and feels for venues that never existed. The result has been fantastic. So I thought about my time on Icon of the Seas and what I've enjoyed about the ship and what truly stands out. First and foremost, without a doubt, Icon feels totally uncrowded. From the day I boarded Icon of the Seas, it became clear that crowds have really not been an issue, and it almost feels weird how uncrowded the ship is. I'm not saying Icon feels like a private yacht or there aren't any lines, but it has been remarkable how uncrowded the ship has felt. It's been especially true in places that I usually expect to find a lot of people, like the pool deck or Royal Promenade. On a sea day, I walked around Chill Island to find a crowd. I walked between all the different pools, and truly, the only places where I really found the largest crowds were at the Hideaway, which is the adults-only pool area, and the Swim and Tonic, which of course is the Swim Up Bar. Those two venues I knew ahead of time were going to be popular, but the rest of the pool deck was really manageable. In fact, if you walked around the pool deck even at like, you know, noon or one o'clock in the afternoon, prime time on a beautiful sea day, there were oftentimes plenty of chairs. Some of the chairs on some sections of Chill Island were completely empty, like there wasn't a towel to be seen in the area. So suffice to say, I was impressed. Now to be fair, the first sailing is not at total maximum capacity, but there are still 5,500 passengers on board along with 2,300 crew members. So that's not a small number of humans on any ship. We're talking about almost 8,000 people on board. And I think the reason Icon feels so uncrowded, so far anyway, is because of how much there is to do that draws people away. There's three different theaters, an entire water park, live music, 40 bars and restaurants, and seven pools along with a variety of other activities happening. Plus, you have a better flow for guests on board with stairs and escalators and shortcuts. It really all adds up to keep people moving around, and the ship really feels emptier than I ever would have expected. The second thing I really love about Icon of the Seas are the really good complimentary restaurants. Royal Caribbean has introduced a lot of specialty restaurants over the last few years, and it gets a lot of attention. But darn if the food included in your cruise fare isn't really good too. Besides the main dining room, Sorrento's Pizza, and Windjammer, there are a few other new venues included in your cruise fare that are drawing me back time and time again. Aquadome Market is a new food hall concept, and it's a real home run. So much variety and so good food. Honestly, I could eat the Greek heroes there every single day. The Surfside neighborhood has three new restaurants, two of which are included. Surfside Bites and Surfside Eatery might be targeted at kids, but who doesn't love chicken tenders, hot dogs, and quesadillas? Base Camp is primarily extra cost items, but I would be remiss if I didn't stop for a complimentary basket of pretzel bites every time I walk by. And then there's Pearl Cafe, which is a revamped replacement of Cafe Promenade. It has grab-and-go snacks available 24 hours a day, new drink dispensers, and a beautiful lounge space. It's one of the most popular spots to hang out on Icon, and it's just an exemplary of this new attention to complimentary food on Icon of the Seas. I think it's always been something Royal Caribbean has struggled with compared to other cruise lines, and you're going to find much better complimentary food on Icon. Something else that really stands out is how wide open everything is, and maybe this contributes to how uncrowded Icon feels, but the wide open spaces and expanded venues really makes a difference. The Royal Promenade stretches from one side of the ship to the other, and it feels so nice having a space that doesn't remind me of a shopping mall. So how do they do this? Well, in the case of Royal Promenade, they remove the promenade-facing cabins to add more space in this neighborhood. Chill Island is the de facto pool deck, right? But Royal Caribbean has spread out the pools and added so many chairs in the shade and sun that you can roll up to the pool at lunch on a sea day and still get a chair. That might not sound like a big deal unless you've been on other ships and know how contentious it can be to get a chair on the pool deck anytime after like, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning, but it's incredible how wide open and how well dispersed by not having a giant pool. Like usually on a cruise ship, you have a pool or maybe like in the main pool, kids pool and the adults pool, right? The solarium here, you have smaller pools, some of which are actually pretty big, but 
go with me on this one. They're not all just all together. They're around the ship. And that really helps move people around. By opening up these decks, to me, it really feels like you have more space to spread out. Something else I really loved about Icon of the Seas was the Empire Supper Club. I wasn't sure if I would like Royal Caribbean's most expensive specialty restaurant ever, but I ended up loving it. I went there twice, and Empire Supper Club is a new dining experience, and the only comparison I can really draw to is the chef's table. Chef's table, in my opinion, had three flaws that kept me from ever loving it. Number one, you have to sit with strangers. Number two, it's paired with a lot of wine, like way more wine than I could ever want. And three, the food was always a little too frou-frou for my taste. Empire Supper Club addresses all three of those problems, and it includes amazing entertainment. It's an intimate dining experience, to be sure, but you're seated at your own tables. You don't have to worry about awkward conversations with strangers at the onset of the meal. And instead of wine pairing, each course is paired with cocktails, and I think there's more universal appeals to cocktails than wine. I certainly like the better anyway myself. As for the food, the entrees are fantastic, such as the Chilean sea bass, and I found each of the appetizers really tasty as well. Given the pacing, I think there's plenty to eat, and it's all really, really good. Now, I get it. It's $200 a person to eat at Empire Supper Club, so it's not cheap. And it's not the restaurant you're going to go to every single night of your cruise. But I do think it's worth trying as a way to celebrate being on vacation and splurging a little bit. Something else that's really near and dear to my heart that I love about Icon of the Seas is there's more outlets than ever. You will not have to go very far to find a power outlet on Icon. There are more electrical and USB outlets on Icon of the Seas than I have ever seen on any other Royal Caribbean cruise ship. This is so helpful to ensure you don't have to keep going back to your stateroom to charge your devices. Staterooms have always been where you could find electrical dedicated power, but for the first time, it feels like there's more power and USB outlets than you can possibly use on Icon. For families, this is a really big deal because you don't have to play the game of, okay, which device can I disconnect now so this other device can charge? And mom, how come someone disconnected my phone? You get it. In the cabin, there are outlets on both sides of the bed, as well as by the vanity. And depending on which room type you have, there are also outlets near the television, storage areas, and more. And I'm not just talking about power or USB-A, there's also USB-C as well. Around the ship, there are lots of outlets in public venues, and that means you can enjoy spending time in these places rather than having to go back to your room to power up or just simply conserving power. In Pearl Cafe and the Overlook, there are outlets in almost every single chair, and at bars and restaurants, you'll find them too. In short, you won't have to go very far to keep your devices charged because on a cruise ship, I find that people use their devices a lot more. Whether you're going through the Royal Caribbean app, listening to music, checking social media, you're going to burn through your battery, and it's really nice being able to keep your devices charged. A huge, huge home run has been the destination elevators on Icon. I never thought a new kind of elevator could have such a profound effect on crowds and waiting, but it's been a real win with the destination elevators on Icon of the Seas. Instead of traditional elevators, you go to a panel, and indicate which floor you'd like to go to, and then you're directed to a particular elevator. So you want to go to deck nine, you hit the button, and then it tells you to go to like, you know, G or whatever. It may not seem like that would make that much of a difference, but the time spent waiting for an elevator in Icon has been substantially reduced. Even when there are big crowds, like when a show lets out, the destination elevators more efficiently get people where they need to go with less waiting. Royal Caribbean told me early on they changed the destination elevators because the cruise line knew that waiting for an elevator was a problem, especially on the Oasis-class ships. Since Icon was going to have more passengers, they needed a better way to move up to 7,500 passengers seamlessly. The result has been a tremendously faster experience, and I think you'll be equally surprised how well the elevators work on Icon. Also, a big surprise to me, something I really like, are the Surfside restaurants. There are many new bars, restaurants, and lounges on Icon, but... I think the least heralded ones are in Surfside because a lot of people have just written off the area as just for kids. But I really think you'd be remiss if you didn't stop for the food in Surfside, regardless if you have kids or not. There are two complimentary restaurants in this neighborhood, as well as an a la carte restaurant. Surfside Eatery is a buffet, and while it's intended for kids, there's a lot of good food here. Plus, I know plenty of adults that are picky eaters as well, but more importantly, plenty of adults also just like quesadillas, hot dogs, and fruit. If you're really in a rush, try the popcorn chicken from Surfside Bites next door. And the real sleeper hit of Icon of the Seas is Pier 7, which is a new specialty restaurant. Pier 7 offers brunch and dinner, and the menu is meant to appeal to parents and kids. Essentially, there should be something for all palates here. The menu consists of an all-day brunch, tacos, poke bowls, and more. It's priced a la carte, so you only pay for what you order. If you have the unlimited dining package, you get a $20 per person per day credit to eat here. Cruise ship food can get really repetitive, so I do appreciate that Pier 7 has more variety to consider, and it's somewhere else you could go for a meal. Plus, I think having all-day brunch is going to be a really popular choice for those that like to sleep in but still want to have breakfast. Now, it's not all rainbows and unicorns on Icon of the Seas. There are a couple things that I really think I didn't love on the ship. 
So let's start with number one, and that's the staggering of the Royal Promenade Entertainment. So one goal Royal Caribbean had with the Royal Promenade was to make the area have much more energy. So they opened up the venues more so that you can experience a taste of what's happening inside. Nearly all the venues, except for the attic, are fully open on the promenade. That way, music can be heard from all over the Royal Promenade and for it to be more enticing for passengers to want to experience it all. I love this change, but I'm not sure the timing has been as well thought out. The issue is they want certain musical acts to be playing when others aren't. And as a result, it seems like you have less time to enjoy them all. As an example, the guitarist in the pub regularly stops performing at 10.45 p.m. so that Boleros, which is located across the promenade and above one deck, can perform. The guitarist in the pub starts earlier, but between shows and dinner, that's wasted time as I found the pub gets busiest on other ships between 10 p.m. and midnight. Noise bleed is inevitably going to happen, but I don't think the entertainment needs to grind to a halt during prime time for these things, so I hope they reconsider that. Next up is the Sweet Lounge, and I gotta say, it feels a little cramped. The Sweet Lounge on Icon is a shared space with Coastal Kitchen, but unlike other Oasis class ships that also do the exact same thing, this area feels far more constricted. As you enter the Sweet Neighborhood, you'll find the Sweet Concierge and the Sweet Lounge hugging the left side of the area, with Coastal Kitchen taking up much of the space. I found there just isn't a lot of seating, and what seating there is, is very close together. This is especially true of the tables in Coastal Kitchen. The nice thing, of course, for Coastal Kitchen is that it encompasses two floors, but I still think the footprint for this neighborhood is a little too small, which there was more space for the Sweet Lounge. And lastly, and this is totally like a math thing and purely aesthetic, but I noticed in many standard cabins, baskets have essentially replaced a few drawers. The problem I have with baskets is the contents are visible to someone outside of the room. The baskets are too small to put larger garments in, like pants, so I think inevitably most people will put other things in them that are smaller, like, I don't know, undergarments. Regardless of what you put in there, if you have friends that come over to your room to hang out, the clothing is visible, and that bothers me personally. Again, that just could be a me thing. But speaking of storage, there is sufficient room to put your clothes and belongings away. However, I do feel like there's less space to put your stuff away, like less drawer space and whatnot, than on, say, on Wonder of the Seas. And I think the change is a result of removing the storage that used to be around the bed frame, like, again, on Wonder. On Wonder, there would be storage space above the bed and to the sides. And on Icon, that space doesn't exist. Instead, they made it a little prettier, and I certainly appreciate that. But there is still plenty of space to put your belongings away, but it doesn't feel like there is as much space as you might find on a waste class ship, if that makes sense. So there you have it, the things that I liked and didn't like about Icon of the Seas, things that really stood out. Obviously, there's a lot more things that I liked about it and plenty of things to enjoy about Icon, but these were the seven things and three others that kind of stood out as top of mind having sailed on Icon of the Seas. Let me know in the comments below if you've sailed on Icon, what your thoughts are on things you absolutely love about this ship, and I'm looking forward to reading your comments down there below. While you're down below our video, hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and turn on notifications. That way, YouTube lets you know we have a brand new video to share. This has been Matt from RoyalCorbianBlog.com, and we'll talk again real soon.